He is the king. Will your response to the real Jesus see you commended? Or will your response see you condemned? Will your response from your heart to the real Jesus, not the Jesus of our imagining, but the real Jesus as made known here in the scriptures, will your personal response see you commended or condemned? A stark question posed by the verses that we had read to us a short time ago. And we're going to consider together this morning Jesus' words as they're found in these verses. We're going to notice four things. Imagine, in a sense, this morning there's a square, there's four sides that make up that square. We're going to examine the four sides that make up the square, which is this section of Scripture. Before we do that, just note very briefly three other things first. As I already mentioned, these are the last words of Jesus' public teaching. So he concludes three years of public ministry with what he says here. And it's not simply a conclusion, it is a climax, it's a height. It's his last words. Now, preachers like to wax on lyrical, don't they, about the importance of last words, how significant they are. I read a story this week, the story of a woman who was a survivor from the Auschwitz concentration camp. She'd gone into the camp at the age of 15 with her brother. He was aged eight. Their parents had already been lost. And later in life, she recalled this. She said, we were travelling in the train going to Auschwitz and I looked down and saw my brother's shoes were missing. And I said, why are you so stupid? Can't you keep your things together? For goodness sake. And we can all imagine elder sisters speaking to younger brothers just like that. But unfortunately, it was the very last thing that she ever said to him. She never saw him again. He didn't survive. And she simply made this comment. She said, I walked out of Auschwitz into life with a vow that I would never say anything again that couldn't stand as the last thing I ever said. Interesting thought for us. Regrettable last words in her case to one individual. Well, Jesus' words aren't regrettable, but they are significant because they're his last words of public ministry in the temple. He speaks privately to follow in his trial from the cross. But in the notice, he gives an answer, verse 35, then Jesus answered. And that should strike you as a little bit odd too because nobody's asked a question. So why in his last words is he answering people? As ever, he's answering their hearts. Because he knows their hearts. He's answering what's going on underneath. And thirdly, notice that his public teaching ends by drawing attention to a poor widow whose offering is now spoken of proverbially all the way around the world. You can find the widow's might in the dictionary. And I say all that because I want to grab your attention to these words. They're rather strange, aren't they, to us? They seem rather bizarre. Fancy ending your public ministry in the temple by drawing attention to a poor widow and two copper coins. And yet it's not only a conclusion, it's a climax. It's an acidic contrast that Jesus is drawing here at the end of his public ministry, a sharp-tasting, sour contrast, which ends with the poor widow. (coughs) Very quickly, you know the setting. Jesus and his disciples have been walking into Jerusalem. They've journeyed there together. The city's now been reached. It's the last week of his life before the cross. On the way, he's been teaching two things, what sort of king he really is and what sort of follower you need to be if you're going to follow the Lord Jesus Christ. What sort of king he's going to die, as we've already sung, in love. What sort of disciple? Well, true discipleship is to deny yourself, 
to take up your cross and to follow him. As he's taught this, his opponents have repeatedly approached him and quizzed him, right hook, left hook, seeking to undermine him, discredit him, destroy him. And of late, the people trying to do that are the religious leaders, the Sanhedrin made up of various groups, the scribes, the Pharisees, the Sadducees. And you may remember they've questioned him about his authority, they've questioned him about taxes, they've questioned him about the resurrection, they've tested him about what's the foremost commandment. And he's answered with great authority every time. The battle at this stage has got really fierce. It's not surprising it ends with an acidic contrast. Remember, he's cursed the fig tree, he's cleansed the temple, he's told the shocking parable of the vine owner who will come and will destroy those he'd put in charge of the vine. Because one of the great themes here is his judgment on Israel. He's not only king, he's a judge. That's why I asked you to consider this morning whether your response is going to leave you commended by the judge or condemned by the judge. It's very solemn. Three main characters for you to consider this morning. There's Jesus, obviously. There's the scribe, whom the crowd are warned about. And then there's the poor widow. So just those three to remember. There's Jesus, there's the one he ends up with, the poor widow, and there's the scribes who he warns the crowd about. It's this section which makes up the square we're going to look at the four signs. We're going to look at the unique way in which Jesus is nothing less than God's very special king. He's the Christ. Then sides two and three, we're going to look at contrasting responses to that claim. Jesus Christ is a unique figure in human history, and responses to him are divided. Amongst those whose response will see them commended, and those who will see themselves condemned. The scribes here, and the poor widow. And the fourth side is that overshadowing all of this is what sort of king he is. So this morning we hope to see, as God helps us and opens our eyes, who he really is, what's unique about him, and the kind of response that we need to make, you need to make. So, number one, have you seen who Jesus of Nazareth really is? Have you seen who he really is? If you have, how blessed you are that your eyes have been opened. Because once you were blind, weren't you? And you didn't see. And if you see this morning, it's because God has done a wondrous miracle of grace in your life. If somebody asked you who he was, what would you say? What would your answer be? It's quite a common question, isn't it? Well, who is Jesus? It's a question he was being asked then. He said to his disciples, who do, who do people say that I am? And then he says, well, who do you say that I am? It's very important we know who Jesus really is. It's a divisive question. We see that then, we see it now. It causes arguments, it causes persecution, it causes wars. Who is the real Jesus Christ of Nazareth? And it's a vital question because our answer determines our eternal destiny, where we will spend forever. Mark's urgent about convincing us who Jesus really is. Chapter 1, verse 1, it's the gospel of Jesus. He is the Christ, the promised special king. He is the son of God. Who do men say that I am? And Peter says, you are the Christ. That's very controversial. Is Jesus of Nazareth really the Christ or not? Is he the one that God promised to send or not? Many years ago, there was an article in the Lancet magazine, the medical magazine, and it talked about the physical effects of crucifixion in the life of Jesus Christ. And there was a huge stink 
about the article because of its title. Nobody would have minded about the physical implications of the life of Jesus, but calling him the Christ caused a great stink because there are those who believe his claims that he is and there are those who vehemently oppose it. What of you this morning? Time is still divided, isn't it, by Jesus. There's before Christ, B.C., there's A.D., the year of our Lord, who is Jesus Christ. And the Christian church still believingly preaches his claims and is persecuted for doing that, that this Jesus of Nazareth, born in Bethlehem, who we celebrate at Christmas, is no one less than the special king that God had promised generations previously. You see, this morning for you, you might regard him as a dead hero. Lots you admire in Jesus Christ. You set a good example that you'd like to follow as best you can, and, and maybe that would make you a Christian, but it won't. And it's not enough, is it, to say that he was a good man if you then dismiss every claim that he made about himself. Because if you don't believe those claims, then how can you think he was a good man? You must think he was either a, a liar or a lunatic to believe what he said, if you don't believe it. So you can't pass verdict on him, judgment on him, and say, well, he's a good man, but I don't believe the words that came out of his mouth. How can he be a good man to you, then? And I want to just look at two things this morning. And it's not really a square, because the first side's a lot bigger than the next three. Have you seen who Jesus is? The claims about him are very controversial. He claims that he is no one less than the eternal God, who never had a beginning because he's eternal, now in flesh appearing. What's different about Jesus of Nazareth? Well, he's God now in the flesh. And he's the only way for us to be right with God. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. There's one God, and there's one mediator between God and men, and that is the man, Christ Jesus. Salvation is found in no one else, because there's no other name given under heaven by which we must be saved. No other name, it's an exclusive claim, Jesus only. Have you seen who he really is? That there really is a God in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. He's the one who, in an instant, created simultaneously time, matter, space. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. He made the human race unique from everything else because only the human race is a copy of which God himself is the original. So there really is this living God we've got to deal with who's made everything and us, but we've rejected him. We've sinned against him. We're separated from this living God. The very God who made me and made me for him himself. To know him, to love him, and, and I haven't. I haven't obeyed him. So I stand under his condemnation and his judgment because little puny me has shaken my little fist at the great and awesome God. But he so loved the world that he always promised that he'd send a rescuer, a saviour, a deliverer, a restorer, in the Old Testament, we read time and time again, he's promised to send a special king who would come and set up God's kingdom and reign forever. <coughs> and that promise was so well known that believers in the Old Testament were looking forward to it being fulfilled. You know, just as a kid today looks forward to Father Christmas coming on Christmas morning, so believers were looking forward to this special king arriving on earth. Is it him? Is it him? Is it him? And Jesus claimed to be the fulfilment of those promises. I am he. I am the one God has promised. And some believed, and others, the religious leaders of the day, particularly opposed violently. 
which is why here they've been challenging his authority. But his answer here is about who he is and about that authority. You see, does he have the right to tell you how you are to live your life? How are you going to live your life? Whose authority are you going to respect? Your own? Somebody else's? Or are you now going to submit yourself to the authority of Jesus Christ? Now, just for a short time, let's just hone in on what he says here because he's answering people who are experts in the Old Testament. They are the scribes. <laughs> So they know its teachings, they know who God is, they know that he's promised a Messiah. And so when at the very end, remember, of this conflict, he says his final thing, he appeals to scripture, to what they should have known. And he very particularly appeals to Psalm 110, a psalm written by a man called David, King David. Now, just a moment, you ought to know something probably of King David. He's the one who killed Goliath with his five stones. He's the one who committed adultery with Bathsheba. He's the most famous king of Israel, King David. He lived about a thousand years before Jesus was born. And he wrote at least 75 of the 150 Psalms. And in dealing with these people, the scribes, Jesus says, you know, don't you, that David was promised that this king of the eternal kingdom would come and would be in his family line. He'd be a descendant of David. That's why Mary and Joseph had to go at the time of Jesus' birth to Bethlehem, because that's the city of David where Messiah was going to be born. And the technical detail that Jesus is dealing here with the scribes is saying, look, you yourself, the scribes, say that the Christ is going to be the son of David. He's going to be a descendant. And as we've sung this morning, you're the son of David. So people like Bartimaeus cried out to Jesus, said, you're the son of David, have mercy on me. They recognised who he was. He's the descendant that comes from David. But in this psalm, David, knowing that the Christ is going to be one of his descendants, says of him, he's my Lord. And that sounds like a bit of a riddle to us, doesn't it? Literally, in the original language, David says, Yahweh is my Adonai. Jehovah, Yahweh, speaks to my Lord, my Master, my God. And so that's the conundrum. How can the Christ be a descendant of David a thousand years later, and yet David's already called him my Lord? Come on, you scribes. Sort that one out. And Jesus, in a sense, doesn't give the answer. He kind of says, I am the answer. I am descended from David just as was promised. And I am superior to David because he acknowledged me as Lord. And you scribes who are expert in the law, David said that, notice, by the Spirit. So it's in the Word that you're experts in. So the Christ is both descendant and Lord, he is God in the flesh, son of David, God's son. And we read, and some of you have smiled this morning, it's been lovely to see, the common people heard him gladly. They were rather fickle, as we're going to see, but they heard him gladly. Have you seen who Jesus of Nazareth really is? He is so much more than a dead hero. He is so much more than a glorious example. He is so much more than a descendant of David. He's David's Lord. 
He's seated right now at the right hand of the Father. And he reigns and is coming back as judge. Have you seen how magnificent, how glorious Jesus of Nazareth is? Much more swiftly. There are two contrasting responses here. Sides two and three of our square. And the first response is from the scribes and the crowd are warned about it. So as we've heard who Jesus really is this morning, there's a warning to us primarily about our pride. Our pride. You see, in these verses, Jesus warns the crowd. Verse 38, beware of the scribes who desire to, and he he lists what they enjoy. They like their long robes, which identified them and distinguished them. Oh, there's a scribe walking down the road. We must stand aside. We must bow. What else? Well, they love greetings in the marketplace. They love the honour and respect. They had the best seats in the synagogues. They were the VIPs. They had the best places at the feasts, we read. They were the most honoured guests. And then we read that they devoured widows' homes. Great religious men. But with no love for neighbour, they are devouring the homes of the poorest people. Possibly refers to the fact that they might have been appointed as executor of wills and they tricked the poor widows who had only got property left out of it. One way or another, they robbed the widows for support of themselves. For a pretense to be showy, to be thought of as godly, they made their long prayers. They were hypocrites. They were proud of themselves and what they did religiously, thinking it would count positively with God. They flaunted their position. They seek to receive glory and the widow's money. They were self-righteous, self-exalting, self-important men of wealth and experience. Elsewhere, Jesus says, well, do as they say, but don't do as they do. They're a bunch of hypocrites. And these men, so full of their own righteousness, said that we're not having this man to reign over us. We're not going to bow to this man's authority. We don't recognise him for who he claims to be. And the warning is that, as you might have realised already this morning, we can be so like them in our hearts. We can so trust in ourselves and in our own goodness and in our religious activity. Jesus tells parables to those who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. Well, we can do that, can't we? We can trust in our own goodness and we have a great propensity to look down our noses at just about everybody else. And so this isn't a problem just out there this morning. It's a problem in here, in this room, in hearts. It's a warning about our pride. And Jesus says these scribes will face a greater condemnation. Jesus of Nazareth, the babe of Bethlehem, is the judge of all the earth. He will return from his throne one day. on the final day of time, to judge the living and the dead. There really is going to be a final judgment. You know, we said before, none of us will escape it. You know, you might have escaped P.E. as a child with a little handwritten note that you said was from your mum. Oh, I escaped P.E. You won't escape this judgment. You won't be able to hide. Like me, you've got to stand before this great big God... And give an account of how you've lived. I read yesterday, at 92 million miles, the sun will burn your eyes out and you think you're casually going to walk into the presence of God? At 92 million miles, the sun, in its glory and brilliance, will burn your eyes out and you think you're going to walk casually into the presence of a holy God. Unbelievers will face condemnation. A just, fair, 
punishment for their sins. And here Jesus says the scribes will face greater. There's going to be degrees. There's going to be a greater measure of punishment for some unbelievers than for other unbelievers. A greater weeping, a greater gnashing of teeth. The scribes, you see, had heard, they'd studied, they should have known. In a sense, by being here this morning, you're almost in that bracket yourself, because you know and you've heard. It's his last words about who he is. Bit of a riddle. He's David's descendant, he's David's Lord, because he's God. And there are still those who won't accept it then and today, and they will face condemnation. As a great encouragement at the end of his ministry in public in the temple, we see the poor widow. <laughs> don't know her name, don't know her sadness. The final action takes place at the temple treasury. Verse 41, now Jesus sat opposite the treasury and he sat and he saw two things. He sat and he saw. And he saw how much money people put in. He either heard the conversation that was going on as the amount was verified, or perhaps he heard the chinks. But he notices that many rich come and put in much, much. He means much, a lot. But he also notices one poor widow comes and throws in two mites. The smallest denomination was going, two copper coins, you know, two halfpennies in old money. And she puts that into the chest. And at that point, Jesus calls his disciples and he declares that she has put in more than. More than all those who have given, verse 43. The most. She's given the most of everybody. And you say, no, that can't be the case, can it, Jesus? So she's put in the least. How can you say she's put in the most? In what terms has she put in the most? And Jesus is saying in God's terms, in God's sight. Why and how? Well, they have put in out of their abundance. She has put in all that she had out of her poverty. It's quoted here, her whole livelihood. And she's the one who is commended. The scribes are condemned. She is commended. You see, God measures not how much we give, but how much we retain. Not what we give, it's all his, but what we retain. They had given their spare change, of which there seems to be much. She spared nothing. She gave her all. <coughs> And why is she commended? Because she displays what Jesus has said previously is true discipleship. She gives in faith and she gives her all. She isn't forgiven as a response to her giving. It's because she's come to know and trust Jesus that she behaves in this way. Her wholehearted devotion follows on from her having become a true disciple of Jesus. She gave everything. He's already said on the road, hasn't he? Whoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loves his life for my sake and the Gospels will save it. Those words that she, had, she gave her whole livelihood could be translated, she lay down her whole life. And she did that in faith, and therefore she's commended. And so Jesus ends this controversy with this acidic contrast. Oh, here's the religious leaders in their flowing garments, but they are self-righteous. They are seeking to take the life of Jesus of Nazareth. The widow is seeking to give her life as a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. In terms of the other answers Jesus has given here, she submits to him. She gives her whole life to him. She knows the word and power of God. She loves him. 
And so here is an act of wholehearted devotion in faith and undivided heart. And Matthew ends his account, everyone who exalts himself will be humbled. And everyone who humbles himself will be exalted. So will your response to the real Jesus see you commended or condemned? If you repent and believe the good news this morning and trust in the Lord Jesus and live a life of true discipleship in him, you'll be commended. Do you exalt yourself, your goodness, your intellect. You'll be humbled to condemnation. And so I leave you with this very briefly. It's the fourth side. Here he is in all of his glory. He's the Christ. There are those who won't have him to reign. They'll be condemned. There are those who trust him and look to him and live for him. They'll be commended. And lastly, we see what sort of king he is because he overshadows the whole episode. How does he come to be crowned? How does he establish his kingdom? How does he free his people from their sins? Well, he lays down his whole life, doesn't he? He lays down his whole life. He is spared not, we read, but he's given up for us all upon the cross. He literally loves his people to death. This great God who is made flesh and bears sin for an undeserving people out of a great love to see them reconciled to him and adopted into his family. I hope this morning you know him and love him and trust him. He came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many, to pay the price of your sin and mine upon the cross. He offered himself to face our condemnation there on the tree. And this David, a thousand years previously, saw the resurrection, having seen the crucifixion. My God, my God, David says a thousand years earlier, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? I am pierced. Psalm 22 and then Psalm 16 David sees the resurrection, that Jesus won't be left in decay. You see, it's God's Son who has humbled himself. As we began with this morning, even to death on a cross. And therefore God has also highly exalted him. That at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. Will you be commended or condemned? Exalt yourself, you'll be humbled. Humble yourself, you'll be exalted. I trust this morning you marvel at his beauty and you'll turn afresh from your sin and your pride and your self-righteousness to give him your all the one who gave his all for you.